Okay, so welcome to lecture number 11. The last two lectures we spoke about variance reduction methods to improve the um, variance cost efficiency of our Monte Carlo estimators. Today I would like to speak about quasi Monte Carlo. Quasi Monte Carlo is a related method. Some people also call this a variance reduction method, but in fact it's a different method, different but related. Okay. So let's start with section one, introduction. So what we have seen is that Monte Carlo methods for integration are comparatively simple and they have the dimension independent convergence order uh, one half. So think about the curve of dimension. There we had a um, decrease of the convergence rate in terms of the dimension. And this convergence order one half is independent of dimension, independent of the dimension. Okay, so what's our setup? Uh, our setup is numerical integration on 0, 1, d here again. So we are given a function h from 0, 1, d to r and x is uniformly distributed on 0, 1, d. And we want to compute this expectation here. So theta is the expectation of h of x, which is just the integral of h over 0, 1, d. And the classical Monte Carlo estimator, we have seen it many times, we are doing um, and IRD copies of our x, here denoted by z1 up to zn, we plug them into h and average. That's the classical Monte Carlo method. Okay, and if you look at the two-dimensional case, um, so here d is equal to 2, uh, you always can think about, um, okay, z set i determine the knots of our integration method. The knots are random, but they are knots. And here you see the knots, which you would have from using 10 to the power 3 realizations of a uniformly distributed random variable on 0, 1 uh, square. And you see, well, they are somehow distributed in the square, but they are not really regularly distributed. And coming from deterministic numerics, from deterministic methods for integration, one would think of, nah, okay, let's spread them out a bit more regular, at least. And this is what quasi Monte Carlo does. So quasi Monte Carlo, abbreviated QMC, is the middle ground between Monte Carlo and classical deterministic integration. And the idea is, here is use more regular points and pseudo random, pseudo random number points for quadrature. Not as regular as in classical integration, but a bit more regular than pseudo-random number points. Okay, and this leads to another um, definition, another object, namely to the low discrepancy sequences. And there are many, many low discrepancy sequences. So Halton, Forrest, Sobo, TNS nets, and so on. Um, they have good discrepancy properties and are good for um, integration in high dimension. So here we would speak about the Halton sequence in detail, but as I said, there are many, many other methods. And this lecture today and this section is only a glimpse on this method because the construction and analysis of low discrepancy sequences, this is number theory. Um, so we cannot cover this in a um, second year lecture. Okay, but it's still good to have a glimpse on it so that you can see um, what, what are other possibilities for high dimensional or high dimensional integration. Okay, so let's start with a bit more mathematics. So small x in the following will be a sequence in 0, 1, d. And for such a sequence, if we look at the first capital N um, components, well, we can define this quantity dn here uh, for our set A. And the set A should be measurable. Otherwise, we couldn't speak about the Lebesgue measure of it. Okay, so um, what is this dn doing here? Um, well, we look at the first capital N points, and then we are check, okay, whether point xi is an A or not. If it is an A, we count it, otherwise not. And this count is divided by n, and then we subtract the Lebesgue measure. So what we are doing is the, well, we compare the relative number of points in A with, with, with its Lebesgue measure. And well, if 
this sequence here, or this part of the sequence, is nicely distributed, this relative number of points in A should be a really good estimate for the Lebesgue measure. Okay, this is one set. Um, so to build up the notion of discrepancy, we need to go a bit further. But before, let's, let's show you a picture. So here we have capital N equal to 5, and we have 5 points here, 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 here. The set A is a rectangle, the yellow rectangle, and 3 out of 5 points are in the rectangle. So the first part is 3 over 5, and since this uh, rectangle is, has here length 3, 4, here length 3, 4, the Lebesgue measure is 9 over 16. So d5 of A um, is just 3 over 5 minus 9 over 16, and this is 3 over 80. So this is an example for, uh, for this definition DNA of x1 up to xn. Okay, as I said, we do not um, we do not stick here with one set, but we are looking at many sets. And okay, so this leads to the notion of discrepancy. So here we are looking at the first n components of our sequence, which is a set, and for the set we can we find dn x1 up to xn, that's the so-called discrepancy, and also d star n of x1 up to xn, that's the so-called star discrepancy. Okay, and what's the discrepancy and the star discrepancy? So as before, we are looking at the relative number of points in a set, um, minus its Lebesgue measure, and here we're taking the absolute value. And, well, what are the sets we are looking at? Here we are looking at the set J's, which are rectangles, left closed, right open. And well, for all these set J's, J, we are looking at the absolute value of D and J, X1 up to Xn, and then we are taking the soup. So the discrepancy is somehow the worst rectangle you can have, left closed, right open, uh, in which respect, in the respect of estimating the Lebesgue measure of J in terms of the relative number of points. And that's the discrepancy. And for the star discrepancy, well, we are looking at similar but different J's. In fact, we restrict to a subclass, a subclass of the J's we have in discrepancy. So if you look here, we have, the, we have A, I, B, I, and here we have zero A, I. So for the star discrepancy, we only look at the rectangles which have zero, 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 zero as a fixed component. And since we have uh, fewer sets here, of course, the star discrepancy always will be smaller than the discrepancy. Okay, that's the discrepancy and the star discrepancy. Um, While well, the error you make, the worst case error you make, if you want to estimate the Lebesgue measure of a rectangle, either of this kind or this kind, by the relative number of points in it. Okay. And, well, why are sequences which have small discrepancy are uh, good for integration. And the next proposition answers this, answers this question. So that's proposition 11.2. So here we have the sequence in 0, 1D, and we have another function from 0, 1D to R, and this function is supposed to be Riemann integrable. And then we have the following statement. So if the discrepancy converges to 0 for n going to infinity, then this estimator here, so evaluate use the function h at xi and average it. This converges to the integral. So this explains why low discrepancy sequences are good for integration. Well, if this discrepancy converges to zero, then the simple estimator, so it's like the uh, standard Monte Carlo estimator, but now with the point, points xi, not realization of uniformly distributed random variables on 0d, and this simple estimator here converges to the integral. So the proof I will do on the tablet notes to do something a bit different now, not only prove some slides, though this will follow soon. And before I do this, let's look at a different perspective of what we have done before. So we were always in our analysis doing, uh, doing or pretending that um, Okay, we had actually really realizations of, zero, of uniformly distributed random variables on 0, 1 or, or 0, 1, d. This we did in our analysis. 
In the implementation, of course, we didn't have this. So we only had pseudo-random numbers. And you can see there is a gap between the theory and the practical implementation. But the practical implementation behaves somehow like the theory. And here we are again in the middle. So pseudo-random numbers typically have small discrepancy. So this result here also sheds light on the practical success of Monte Carlo. So we are looking at integrable functions. Uh, of course, first on the Lebesgue integrable, but in, ca in some cases we have also Riemann integrable functions. And then we are applying pseudo-random numbers on, on it and are building this, this approximation of the integral here. And Monte Carlo's theory tells us it converges if we would have really realization of random numbers. But this proposition t also tells us, well, if the discrepancy of the points we get from the pseudo-random number generator is small, then this is also a good, good approximation of the integral we want to approximate. Well, of course, this is a bit of philosophical part, but while it's actually really helpful to also understand the practical success of Monte Carlo. Okay, so let's start with the proof. So let's first recall our assumptions. So x is the sequence in 0, 1, d with the property that its discrepancy goes to 0 for capital N going to infinity. And what do we have to show? Well, then we have to show that this estimator here of the integral by just evaluating at the points of this low discrepancy sequence, well, this approximation of the integral actually converges to the integral for arbitrary Riemann integrable f from 0, 1, d to r. Okay, the step will consist, the proof will consist uh, of two steps. And then the first one we are looking at a simple integrand, namely a step function. Okay, um, for a step function, what do we need to know? Well, the rectangles for the indicator functions, which enter the step functions. Okay, and T well here is one rectangle. So the product of AKI, product of the interval from AKI to BKI, AKI closed, BKI open, and we have n intervals of, uh, we have n rectangles. So the rectangles are running from 1 to n, and we need this weight, uh, weights alpha i, also running from 1 to n. Okay. And with these rectangles and with these weights, we can build a step function. f of x, well, sum over the weights, times the indicator functions of the rectangles. So this is just a standard step function. Okay. And what do we have in this case? Well, here's our approximation of the integral. And now we write out the inter integrand in a bit more detail. So by just using the definition of f, and here we have alpha i, or alpha j, because we we sum now over j from 1 to small n. And here is the indicator function, jj, evaluated at xi. Okay. And if you look here, well, we need to check whether xi is in jj. And this running over all i's. Well, and that's how the discrepancy enters again. Why? Um, well, this is the same if I run over the i's 
if I count all my xi, which are in JJ. Well, and that's one part. And let's compare with the other part. So the integral we want to approximate, well, if we write this out or, or use the definition, well, then it's just the weighted sum over the Lebesgue measures over the intervals. Okay, and now, well, here we have the number of points in JJ, and here we have the Lebesgue measure of JJ. But we have vanishing discrepancy, so um, the number of points in JJ actually converges. The relative number of a relative numbers of relative number of points in JJ actually converges to the Lebesgue measure, and this is essentially the proof of part one, well, in the case of a step function. But let's um, f formalize the antium. So let's now define this here as a n and this here as a. So what did we show? Oh, no. Well, we didn't show it yet, but we are soon to show, soon to show it. Um, so if I look at the difference between a capital and an a absolute value, well, then it's less or equal than the sum over the j's, absolute value of alpha j, and now here 1 over n times the number of points in the rectangle jj, and we compare this with the Lebesgue measure of JJ. Okay, and by assumption, this goes to zero. And so the overall expression goes to zero. So for a step function, well, the convergence of the approximation to the integral well, is just the fact that the discrepancy converges to zero. Okay, and that's what was step one. That's basically the main step. Step two is exploiting the definition of Riemann integrability. Okay, let's now do the second part. The second part breaks down to the Riemann integrability of a function. So a function is Riemann integrable if and only if for all epsilon greater than zero, we can find step functions f1 and f2 with the property that the step functions envelope f, so f1 is less or equal than f, and f is less or equal than f2. And the fact that the integrals over f1 and f2 only differ by an epsilon. Okay, and then we can start now a chain of inequalities, which will in the end prove our assertion. Okay, so let's start with the integral over f. And from now on, I, I will always drop the domain of integration. It's always the same, 0, 1, d. Okay, and let's abstract an epsilon. Why do we abstract an epsilon? Well, by this fact here, we know now that the integral over f minus epsilon is less than the integral over f1. Well, now we can use the first part because the integral over f1 can be written as this limit here, as the limit of the approximating quadrature formula. Okay, now the limit exists, also the, 
the limb inf exists. So I can replace the limb limit by the limb inf. Why do I want to do this? Um, because I would li now like to use that f1 is less than f. So the limb inf um, with the f1s is smaller than the limb inf with the f's. Okay, and trivially the limb inf is less or equal than the limb soup. So I have this now. Okay, um, why do I using the limb inf and the limb soup? Well, uh, if I sum over the f, a priori it's not known whether the limit exists. Okay, and now I can use again the first part. Oh, I'm not ready to use the first part yet because um, we have to invoke first um, F2. Okay, but F is less or equal than F2. So we can now bounce this from above if we sum over the F2s. Well, end by one, we know that the limit exists. So the limb is equal to the limb soup. And this is just the integral over F2. Okay, and now let's again use the red stuff. The integral over F2 is less or equal than the integral over F plus epsilon. So in the end, what we have shown, let's use the additional color. We started with this integral over f minus epsilon. We ended up with the integral over f plus epsilon. And in between, we have the limb inf and the limb soup of our approximating sequence. So epsilon was arbitrary. Well, we can conclude what we want. So we have um, that the limit exists. If we use our approximation with the f and it equals the integral we want. And that finishes, finishes the proof. Okay, so in, in today's lecture, I would like to show you at, at least one low discrepancy sequence, and that be, will be the so-called Horton sequence. As I told you, for the construction and analysis, one needs number theory, and here's the first ingredient, namely the so-called base P expansion. So P is a prime number, and I is an integer, then I has a unique base P expansion given by this expression here. Uh, so what we are doing, we fix our i, which we, are given, which we have been given, and then we expand this i in powers of pj. And the coefficients aj are running uh, between 0 and p minus 1. So i has a unique representation of aj times pj, and uh, the sum here runs from 0 to infinity, but it will be always a, fine, a finite um, sum, because we have integers. Okay. And starting from this expansion here, we can build the low discrepancy sequence, the so-called van der Korpel sequence. So P is still the same prime as here, and then the basis P van der Korpel sequence is given by this expression. So Xip, while it's the sum from j running from 0 to infinity, Aji P minus j minus 1. So what, is, what has changed here? So, um, while well here we have an i, here we have not j but minus j minus 1. But the aji's, well the aji's are the coefficients of the base p expansion of our i. So all what we are doing is here to get 
the van der Korput sequence is. Um, okay, so let's first expand as many integers as we need in the in their base p expansion, and then um, look at their coefficients. And instead of p j, we are multiplying them with p minus j minus one. So that's a simple procedure. And well an example which makes the whole definition probably a bit clearer. So here we have base 2 and here we are expanding 1, 2, 3 and 4 in powers of 2. So 1 is 1 times um, 2 to the power 0, 2 is 0 times 2 to the power 0 plus 1 times 2 to the power 1 and so on. 3 is 1 times 2 to the power 0 plus 1 times 2 to the power 1 and 4 in the end is 0 if you have this component 2 to the power 0, 0 for the component 2 to the power 1, but 1 for 2 to the power 2. Okay, well this is the base 2 expansion of 1, 2, 3 and 4. And how we, we now get the uh, corresponding um, parts of the van der Korput sequence? Well, the, proced the procedure is keep the coefficients, but replace the powers of 2 by its inverse minus 1. Or oh, the multiplicative inverse minus 1. So um, if we have 1 times 2 to the power 0, we have now 1 times 2 to the power minus 1. So we are getting 1 half. And here we have 0 and 1. Here 2 to the power 0, 2 to the power 1. So we keep the 0 have a 2 to the power minus 1. We keep the 1, but we have a 2 to the power minus 2 here, and so we are getting 1 over 4. Well, and here is the same procedure again and again. So we have 1, 1, 2 to the power 0 is replaced by 2 to the power minus 1. Here we have 1, and 2 to the power 1 is replaced by 2 to the power minus 2, and we get 3 over 4. And here is the same, 0, 0, 1, so 0, 0, and here we have 1, times 2 to the power minus 3, and we get 1 over 8. Okay, and here is the same for 3, uh, base 3 expansion. So 1 we can write as 1 times 3 to the power 0. So the first part of the van der Korput sequence in base, uh, van der Korput sequence for base 3 is actually 1 to the power 3 minus 1, so it's 1 over 3. For 2, we get, well, we get 2 is, um, 2 times three to the 3 to the power 0, so the second part is 2 times 3 to the power minus 1. For 3 we have 0 and 1, so here we have again 0, and here 1 times 3 to the power minus 2, and that's 1 over 9. And for 4 we have 1, 1 here, and so we are getting here 1, so 1 over 3, plus 1 over, no, 1 over 9, and that's 4 over 9. Well, that's the construction principle for the van der Korput sequence. Well, this is the construction principle of the van der Korput sequence. Okay, so this is one-dimensional and well, one-dimensional, well, there are really good one-dimensional integration rules, so for 1D we don't need this, we need this for, mi for multi-dimensional and in particular high-dimensional problems. And well, this leads to the so-called Horton sequence, that's the definition 11.5. And here we are looking at dimension D. We have D prime numbers, P1 up to PD. Well, they are all prime and they are not the same uh, pairwise. So PI is not equal to PJ for I not equal to J. And then if we have here PI, so XJ PI, so this is the corresponding van der Korput sequence for each pi. And if we plug them together, well, we are getting a, a d-dimensional sequence. And this is the so-called d-dimensional Horton sequence with basis p1 up to pd. Okay. And the question is, well, has this thing here a vanishing discrepancy for n going to infinity and so on and so on and so on? And well, it has good um, discrepancy properties. So one can show that the d-dimensional Horton sequence satisfies this estimate here. So the star discrepancy, d star n, um, 
of uh, x1 up to xn is bounded from above, so the absolute value of d star x, uh, x1 up to xn is bounded from above by a constant which depends on p1 up to pd times the logarithm of n to the power d um, divided by capital N for n greater or equal than 2. Okay, well this proposition tells us um, Okay, for n going to infinity, the star discrepancy converges to zero. And more precisely, we have this log n to the power d divided by n behavior. So if d is not too large, well, so one can expect a 1 over n behavior. So the proof, well, the proof I can, cannot do here. So if you're interested, you can look at this book. That's, that's the, one of the classics on Quasi Monte Carlo by uh, Niederreich. Okay, so this is the Horton sequence. So construct the um, van der Korput sequence with different primes, glue them together in a d dimensional sequence, and the star discrepancy of the sequence behaves like log n to the power d divided by n. Okay, and well, I would like to show you now a few illustrations for the Horton sequence. So if you look at the first 10 to the power 3 points of the Horton sequence uh, in dimension 1 and 2, while here we have base 2 and 3, then it looks like this. So it's not really a regular grid, but it's less regular than you would expect to have from uh, pseudo-random numbers. But, well, here's my typically but, um, Horton is not solving any problem. So if you look in dimension 29 and 30, where you have base 109 and base uh, 113, well, then there you have these patterns here. Well, and these patterns, well, if you look at this, clearly um, the discrepancy is not really good. If you have only 10 to the power 3 points. If you have more points, of course, uh, the rectangle will fill up, but here we have large, large gaps. Okay, these were two pictures for the Horton sequence, and well, as I said, there are many, many more low discrepancy sequences, in particular with better projection properties, and for example, the Sobel sequence. Why do I mention the Sobel sequence? So, and if you do the scrambling, so here is dimension one and two of the first Horton points again. So it's a bit more regular as before, but the striking differences in dimension 29 and 30. So before we had these large gaps, and here we still have some gaps, but the gaps are much, much smaller. Okay, so that was um, a practical, practical perspective on, on the Horton sequence and how to use them in an implementation. And but what about the error of QMC integration? We have seen, okay, low discrepancy sequence are good for integration, so we have at least convergence, but can we have error bounds? And the answer is yes, we can, uh, at least for a specific class of integrants. And these class of integrants, for them, we need the so-called hardy krause variation. So we start with a function, which is once differentiable, once partially differentiable in each component. So uh, here we have the partial derivative, partial derivative with respect to the first component, second, and so on. And as before, our function is defined on 0, 1, d, and maps to r. And then we can define the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause as follows. So it's given by this large sum here, uh, the sum over k from 1 to d, and here a sum over all i in j, j d, k, and here we have v, k of h, i. So let's start a bit backwards. So what is this here? So v, k of f is the integral over 0, 1, k, so this k is this k here, and what do we integrate? We are integrating the um, absolute value of this function here. So f is a function from 0, 1, k to r, and we are integrating over f111. 1, 1, 1. 
So we partially differentiate f with respect to each component, take the absolute value and then integrate it. And this gives vkf. Okay, so here we have vk of hi. So i is um, a set of, of integers, which we will speak about later. And here we start with a function h. And hi is the restriction of h to the variables which are given by the set of integers. And well, if a component is not in the set, we just set this component to 1. So hi is the restriction of, I to, of h to i with uil equal to 1 if il is not equal, if it's not, it's not in i. Okay, this is hi. VKF and well, we are getting our HI and our I from this set JKD. In JKD, well, these are K tuples which are built from the integers between 1 and D and in increasing order. So if we have here a K, um, we have here well, a K tuple an increasing k tuple and the d tells us okay the integers here have be have have to be between 1 and d okay this explains j k d okay and let's go back here so v h so we are running over all dimensions here and the dimension here gives the length uh, of these k tuples so we're running over this, and then we are running here over all um, k tuples, all different k tuple k tuples which have um, entries between one and d are, and are increasing. So this is here, and then we build our h i by the restriction of h to i. So the components which are not active, which are we just set to one, and then we compute v k of this restriction of h to i in this way by partially differentiating h i taking the absolute value and then we integrate okay this is a lengthy definition but this is what it is in, and in 1d life is much simpler so for d equal to 1 the variation in the sense of hardy krauser is just the integral from 0 1 absolute value of the derivative of h here it's much, much, much simpler because, well, here for d equal to 1, well, there's only the one tuple with um, 1 as a component. And also the other thing simplify here. Okay, so this is a lengthy definition. Let's give you an example. Uh, so here's a three-dimensional example. So h is x1 squared plus, plus x2 times x3. Okay. Um, J, K, D, well, runs from 1 to D. And so we are looking now at K equal to 1, K equal to 2, and K equal to 3. So what is J, 1, 3? Let's look here. So we have K is equal to 1, so we have the tuples of length 1, and the components are between 1 and D, and D is 3. So here we have J, 1, 3 consists of 1, of 2, and of 3. And the meaning of this entries here, of this of this entries here in J13 is these are the active variables. So if we if we build H1, well then we just keep X1 active, and that that the rest of the components equal to one. So we here we have one times one, so we get a plus one. And for H2 and H3, it's it's the same. So for H2. We only keep the second component and the others we set to 1. Well, and we get 1 plus x2. And for h3, it's the same. So we just keep x3 and we set the others to 1. So we are getting also here 1 plus x3. Okay, so to end up with the parts, with the ingredients for the variation, we, we now have to compute the partial derivatives. So h1 we have to differentiate with respect to the first variable, h2 with respect to the second, h3 with respect to the third. And if we do this, we get here 2x1, 
here we get just one and here we get just one. And in the end we have to take the absolute value of this and to integrate. So here it's really simple. So we're integrating uh, over one from zero to one and so we get one and here also. But here it's also not much more difficult. We have to integrate 2x with respect to x over 0, 1, and again we are getting 1. Okay, that was k equal to 1. Now k equal to 2. So two dimensional entries um, out of the three dimensional sets, 1, 2, 3, and they have to be increasing. So we have 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. And again, these are the active variables. So h12 is x1 squared plus x, x2 because x3 is equal to 1. h13 is x1 squared plus x, x3 squared uh, plus x3 because x2 is 1. And for h23 we have 1 plus x2 times x3 because x1 is set to 1. And then we have to build the partial derivatives with respect to x2 and x1. Well, and here the outcome is simple because if we differentiate with respect to x, x2 first, well, this disappears. And if we differentiate with respect to x1, this disappears. And for h1, 3 is the same. So in both cases, we get 0 and 0. And here we have a product so if we of x2 and x3. If we partially differentiate with this with respect to x3 and x2, we get a 1. So in the first two cases, well, the contribution to the variation is 0 and 0, and if we integrate the 1, we are getting again 1. Okay, and let's look at the final k. k is equal to 3. So here we have 1 to 3 as a tuple, and well, h1 to 3 is not a restriction of h, it's, it's again h. And if we differentiate, differentiate this with respect to x, x3, x2, and x1, well, we are getting 0. So here we are also getting a 0 contribution. Okay, so let's summarize because we have to sum it up. We have to sum it up in, in the end. So here we have 1, 1, 1, which gives 3. Here we have 1, which gives 4, and here we have 0. So the variation in the sense of how the crowd is 4 for this particular example. So this structure is not really important, but um, the main thing is to show you how we are running over the set of different active variables. So here we have the active variables in dimension 1, dimension 2, and dimension 3. Okay, but so I've promised you a specific error bound, and here it is, the so-called cox lafka inequality. So in this cox lafka inequality, for functions h, which have finite variations in the sense of Hardy and Krause. Um, well, the cox lafka inequality states that the integration error, if we want to compute this integral here, and are using the average here built on the points x1 up to xn, well, the error is bounded by the variation times the star discrepancy. And well, if you go back, for example, to the Horton sequence, for the Horton sequence, we know that d star n decays like log n d divided by n. So if d is not large, well, we have a convergence rate like 1 over n, which is quite okay. Okay, well, that's the cox lafka inequality. Well, it factorizes the integration error in terms of the variation and the discrepancy. And how to prove this? Well, I would like to do here the proof only for d equal to 1. For a higher dimension, it's similar, but of course, much more technical. Okay, so do, let's do it in d equal to 1. So without lots of generality, we can assume that x1 up to xn, well, the points are ordered. x1 is less or equal than x2, and so on, less or equal than xn. And for writing it down, the proof, uh, it will be really helpful to set x0 equal to 0 and xn plus 1 equal to 1. Okay, first thing is, so we want to estimate the integral from 0 to 1, hx dx, to set this equal to a, and to do a partial integration. So a can be written as h of 1 minus the integral from 0, 1, hx, 
h prime x dx. That's just integration by parts. For a n, which is short for our estimator, so evaluating h at all the points x i and average, for h n we can do a summation by parts. That's a discrete analogon of integration by parts. So what we are getting is that a n is equal to h1 minus 1 divided by n and then the sum over the i's um, i's from um, and then we sum up i times h of x i plus 1 minus h of x i okay that's summation by parts well if you're not familiar with it what you can do to verify the equality is is just to write out the sequence here and then many many terms are cancelling and only this will, will remain. Okay, so we have this expression for hn. What we can do is, because here we have h of xi plus 1 minus h of xi, h is differentiable, continuously differentiable, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and write this expression here as an integral from xi to xi plus 1 over h prime x dx. Okay, this is from here to there. We are getting by applying the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so we have this expression for A, this expression here for AN. And if we look at the difference, so A minus A capital N, well, we can subtract both. So H of 1 and H of 1 disappears. This gets, this gets a plus. Here we keep the minus. So we're having that a minus a n is a sum from 0 to capital N, integral x i, x i plus 1, and here i divided by n, here is 1 over n, here is i, so we have i divided by n minus x h prime x dx. Okay, and now we have, we have achieved the following, so this is the quantity we need to look at. And well, the error bound should be in terms of the variation. In 1D, is the variation is just the, absolute, the integral over the absolute value of the derivative times the discrepancy. So this looks as a good step for, for this. And the variation we can bring in easily. Well, if we want to estimate the absolute value, well, we can take the absolute value inside here. So we are having the um, integral over absolute value of h prime x dx. And this here, um, here we also have the absolute value, i divided by n minus x. And this we can take out of the integral if we are looking at the maximum over all the x's and then the maximum over all the i's. So this is just the standard estimate for the integral. So take the absolute value inside and then taking this quantity to the outside by estimating its, its, its maximum and this is done here. Okay, so now we are close to finish the proof. Okay, so now we are close to finish the proof. So this is what we have achieved. The difference between A and N or more precisely the absolute value of it is bounded by the max over I max of x between xi and xi plus 1, um, boundaries included, absolute value of i divided by n minus x, and here the sum over these integrals. Okay, so xi, xi plus 1, well, by construction, this is a decomposition of, our, of the unit interval. So if you sum this up, we get the, inter interval from, the integral from 0 to 1, absolute value, h prime x dx. And this is the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause in d equal to 1. So here we are set. What to do with the first component here, the first part? Here we should arrive at the star discrepancy in the end. And as you see, we will arrive. Now the first thing is to, here we have the max and xi, xi plus 1 um, included. And t one thing we can do is, instead of having the max, we can have the soup. Um, and the soup we can have with open boundaries, but we only need it with the left open boundary. So why do I do this? So the max over x 
uh, xi, xi plus 1 um, boundaries included. This is the same as a soup if I neglect the left boundary because the integrand here is continuous. Uh, the integral, not the integrand. The thing over which we build the max of the soup is continuous. So why do we do this? Well, the soup, this soup here is, is the same as this soup. And what we are having here, here we are counting the relative numbers of xj's which are between 0 and x. And here 0 included, x, x, x excluded. Okay? The relative number and compare this with x. And if x is between xi and xi plus 1, um, xi excluded, xi plus 1 included, because here we have this open interval, so for such an x, this is just here i divided by n. So here we have actually equality. We also could have written equality, but lesser equal is also not wrong. Okay, and now we have this max over the soups, and well, max over the soups, the max runs over the eyes, and so we are covering the whole interval again. And what we are ending up is, well, we can ignore the max and have the soup over all x between 0 and 1 of this quantity here. But if we have the whole interval, by definition, this is just the star discrepancy. So in this way, we come from this max max to a max soup, to the soup and to the star discrepancy. And this finishes the proof. Okay. So this is the proof of the kaxma lafka inequality, and I would like to close this lecture with, um, with a small example. So again, one of our running examples, namely the road system. Well, here we had to compute the expectation of the quickest way from A to B. Um, all roads had a certain uh, random length, the so random time amount was needed, and we could write, that we could write down everything in terms of uniformly distributed random variables, uniformly on 0, 1. Okay, so why do I mention this? Because we can rephrase now in a problem which is accessible to quasi-Monte Carlo by, by writing down this h of u here. So this function we need to integrate over 0, 1, 5 to get the expected uh, length of the quickest way. And here I applied quasi Monte Carlo to it twice, once with the Horton sequence, once with the Sobel sequence, and was running from 10 to the power 2 to 10 to, 10 to the power 7 in both cases. And in both cases, I computed the average and the standard deviation. So the average here, well, one thing we didn't saw with Monte Carlo, it seems to stabilize in both cases. So the first five digits are 9.7176. So this sh should seem to be the first five digits of the quantity we want to estimate. So this st stabilization effect we didn't see in uh, using Monte Carlo. Uh, running time, so for 10 to the power 6 it was less than one second. Uh, for 10 to the power 7 I got running times up to five seconds, but here you see while well, 10 to the power 7 is actually not really necessary. The standard deviation I also computed. And the standard deviation here has, of course, no, no, um, no meaning for the method itself. For the standard deviation, well, that's an estimate for the standard deviation of, um, of this random variable. But, 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 of course, one can also estimate this. And here we have also a stabilization effect. So it seems to be that... Um, the variance of this random variable or the standard deviation, so the first five digits of it, are 1.2364. Okay. And well, here I just computed the standard deviation because if you modify a Monte Carlo code to quasi Monte Carlo, well, you only need to exchange the, uh, the input, so pseudo random numbers, to replace it by the um, low discrepancy numbers. And but I also kept the standard deviation to point out um, a deeper thing. 
so how to compare um, quasi Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo. So we have different error estimates, but here is a deterministic method. Uh, Monte Carlo is a random method. How to compare these two methods at a practical example in a more rigorous way. And this will be addre addressed in the next lecture. In the next lecture, the next lecture will be about output analysis. Okay, thank you for the day.